Brandis Freeman is a Chicago correspondent for Chicago Tonight and host of Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, both on Chicago's PBS affiliate WTTW. Her reporting on education and criminal justice has appeared on PBS NewsHour and NPR's The Takeaway. Before joining Chicago Tonight, Brandis worked as a reporter and anchor for WBBM News Radio 780 and as a producer reporter for WJLA TV, ABC7 in Washington, D.C. In addition to earning multiple regional Emmy Awards for her work, she's also earned multiple Peter Lissagor Awards, recognizing excellence in journalism from the Chicago Headline Club. Originally from Mississippi, Brandis's work has taken her to numerous cities, including Kansas City, Missouri, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Wichita Falls, Texas. She served on the board of the Chicago Headline Club, which is the local chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, and is a member of the, of the Education Writers Association and National Association of Black Journalists. Brandis is a graduate of Dillard University in New Orleans, where she earned a degree in mass communications, and Columbia University in New York City, where she earned her master's degree in journalism. Brandis lives in Evanston with her husband and two sons. Welcome, Brandis Freeman. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to, yeah, come on up, please. Um, <laughs> I was going to read the bio, but uh, would everyone help me welcome Dr. Gale to the stage? I think most of you know who she is, right? So I don't think we necessarily, I mean, you know who you came to see. Me, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't think we need to necessarily go through all of that. We know that she is leaving us uh, in a month, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and thank you for joining us. I'm, I'm happy My to be pleasure. here. And I'm happy to see all of you. It's kind of like a family reunion. How many of you have like run into people that you haven't seen except for in the Zoom box in like the longest time? So it's really exciting. Though I'll, I'll be keeping my mask on because I've got a trip coming up, but if I get the COVID before I leave. <laughs> um, so Dr. Gale, welcome. How are you today? Oh, good. Just wonderful to see everybody out there. So uh, this is your third visit in this format to City Club. Um, you know, in your second one, because I went back and I watched it, and um, you mentioned at the time that you didn't know a whole lot about community foundations and a bit of a quote, had no idea what you were getting yourself into. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you have plenty of experience. Um, so it's not that you weren't prepared for the position, but it was different for you. Um, how would you say you've grown and changed in these five years? Yeah, well, in a lot of ways, and you're right. Um, when I first came here, um, I'd never lived in Chicago. I'd never worked with a community foundation, and I had spent most of my career globally coming to work at a local, at a local context. But, you know, I think um, all of the different experiences that I had kind of prepared me in many ways for, for this moment, and I think Chicago, which we may talk more about, um, has a very wonderful way of welcoming people. And so, you know, it didn't take long before I felt very much at home here. Um, you know, I've, I've said this before, but I almost felt like I was welcomed to, to death. I was also, <laughs> I, I definitely You're was- so welcome. I, I was definitely welcomed into about 10 pounds, um, <laughs> you know, between all of the uh, festivities. And this is, you know, this is a festivity town and people love to uh, have uh, parties. Good meal. and Yeah, good meals and <laughs> cocktail parties and receptions, et cetera. But, you know, I guess what, what to your question, you know, the way I think I have grown the most is this is the only job where the city was directly my job. You know, I've lived in uh, Atlanta, where I'm returning to longer than any city that I've, you know, that I've ever uh, lived in professionally. But I never worked uh, my work never had anything to do with Atlanta. You know, I was at CDC, that's a national organization. I headed CARE, that's an international organization. This is the one city that I've lived in where the city is my job. And I think that close connection really um, 
made a difference in how I saw my work, how I saw the people, the neighborhoods. And so for me, I think that experience um, really gave me a real grounding, but a real depth in appreciation for the ways in which cities come together or don't, um, and also a greater appreciation for all of the things that people contribute. And Chicago, you know, I've said this many times, is so uniquely civically engaged and how people love this city, um, you know, is, is something that to me is pretty remarkable. Would you say, was that the most surprising thing for you or what was the most surprising? Because there were a lot, a lot of new for you in coming to Chicago and starting that position. Yeah, you know, um, and you know, I've, I have also said this before, I think that the extreme degree of segregation and the, the um, contrast, and it's not that we don't see this in other urban cities. I think because of the size of Chicago, it amplifies it even more. And so I think the, those disparities and the fact that they have existed for so long um, and can be very stark um, when you go from one neighborhood to another. Uh, you know, we talk often about the fact that Chicago has the largest life expectancy gap of any city in America, um, and that you can drive six to nine miles away and see such difference uh, that you can talk to people who live in neighborhoods where they have never seen Lake Michigan. You know, so some of those sorts of things are. Um, in many ways, um, you know, jaw dropping. And I've worked in some of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, but the disparities are somehow um, more manifest here, I think, than many other places that I've lived. And of course, that, that segregation comes at a cost. I mean, was, and I know all, obviously you all did your research before unveiling uh, the strategy in 2019 to address wealth inequality. But, you know, when you come to Chicago and you're surprised by seeing all of this, did that sort of influence your thinking at all when coming to the conclusion that this needs to be your North Star? Yeah, it did. And, you know, you said the cost of segregation. In fact, the report that uh, Metropolitan Planning Council um, put together around the cost of segregation that said that up to $4 billion is lost every year due to segregation and that, you know, um, Chicago ranks um, I'm forgetting if it's 87th out of 100 cities in, in terms of economic growth, even though we have a gleaming downtown. All of those things um, really help to influence our thinking that if we could have an impact on this wealth inequality, uh, that 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 could really help to catalyze a lot of other change. And you know, we know that Chicago, you know, and uh, again. This is not different than other urban areas, um, but you know, Chicago has a problem with violence. Chicago has a problem with life expectancy gap and health expectancy, access to quality education. And you can go on with a lot of the issues, but underneath all of those issues, you know, this wealth gap is really um, kind of a root cause in many ways. And so this interconnectedness, as opposed to taking one issue alone, we really felt that looking at the wealth gap, but doing it in a way that was sustained. So, you know, we launched a 10 year strategy. I don't think in 10 years we will have closed the racial and ethnic wealth gap, but if in 10 years, we're consistent with what we do and that we can start showing what does it take to make a difference, then I think that's a, you know, that could be a real contribution. And I would imagine after the 10 year strategy, there may be, you know, strategy 2.0 and continued because this is work that, that will take a long time. We didn't get here overnight. It's not going to change overnight. Um, so of course, in 2019 is when you all unveiled this strategy, and and you know you know some of the research shows, for example, for every dollar of accumulated wealth white families have, black families have just one cent. Did y'all catch that? Mm -hmm. Latinx families have eight cents. Um, and obviously, you and you kind of just touched on it. You know, it's a 10-year strategy. Maybe there's an upgrade in 10 years, but you know, along the way, how do you measure the success or the impact of that strategy? Well, first of all, um, we know as the Chicago Community Trust, we're not going to do it alone. And we see this very much as a partnership strategy. And we can 
talk more uh, about that. But, you know, um, I think what we hope that we can do is working with partners, working with the private sector, working with the public sector, working with other philanthropic partners, working with communities, working with nonprofit sector, and really thinking about what is the right role for each of us? And can we use our philanthropic dollars to actually catalyze change? And so, you know, when I look at our strategy, which looks at how do you uh, really help to grow household wealth? How do you look at catalyzing neighborhood investment? And how do you look at collective power at the community level? Each of those is done in a way that really works with partners so that we can use our dollars to leverage other dollars and other actors in ways that can really make a difference. And so, you know, our hope is that we can use our philanthropic resources where they can be most used. Um, oftentimes, philanthropic dollars are the more flexible dollars, sometimes the first dollars in, uh, you know, and think about our work in neighborhood uh, uh, development and catalyzing economic development in disinvested neighborhoods. A lot of times, you know, our work is the pre-development work. What do you need? What are the tools that you need to be able then to get the private sector dollars for um, projects at, at uh, a neighborhood level. So if we can be smart about how we use our resources, if we can be smart about how we use our voice, um, how we can convene, all of those things go hand in hand. And you know, another part of what we have um, with this strategy launched is our work in policy and advocacy. Because you know, philanthropic dollars are one thing, but when you're talking about how do you change systems, that's policy work. That's not dollars and cents. That's how do you actually change policies and change laws that can have long lasting impact. And you know, we all know that poor policy in many ways is what got us to where we are. And so good policy and smart policy and policy that is pro-poor and that thinks about the needs uh, at a community level are the kind of policies that can make a big difference, even greater than what our philanthropic dollars, I mean, our collective philanthropic dollars can do. So to that point, you know, do you feel that either since the announcement of this strategy or at all, you know, has the, because obviously this is, Everybody has a responsibility here, right? You mentioned, you know, a public sector as well as private, but has philanthropy uh, and your other community partners, have they stepped up to, to the job as well? Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the things I think um, we were gratified that as w once we announced our strategy around economic equity and closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap, that we started seeing more conversation around it. It's not just because of us. I mean, I think it's because we reached a time in history where it was becoming more and more evident. Um, you know, I, I think about the report that WBEZ did that showed that um, investment in single neighborhoods in the north side were greater than all of the investments in uh, black neighborhoods in the south side. And I think more and more reports and more and more information like that started, I think, changing the dialogue around what we had to do. And then we got the one-two punch of first COVID, which highlighted uh, the racial inequity, and then the murder of George Floyd, where I think people really did start understanding that what we're dealing with is a systemic issue and is a longstanding issue. And so while both of those were unfortunate and difficult occurrences, I think they did shift the dialogue and change the dialogue, not just with philanthropic um, organizations, but with the private sector and with, with others, with the public sector. So I think, you know, we're at a moment here in Chicago where I think we have a real opportunity um, where we can galvanize and continue to move forward. You know, you mentioned the summer of 2020, obviously, it seemed like the country was on fire in some places, literally. Um, and a lot of people suddenly who had maybe not been quite paying as much attention before suddenly cared and were getting involved in different ways. And the, the need isn't necessarily as urgent today or it doesn't feel as urgent today as it did in the summer of 2020. Um, so do you feel that 
companies, agencies, organizations, are they still, you know, are they walking the walk today that they started talking about in 2020? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so does everybody feel the same sense of urgency? I don't think so. Um, I think that, I, you know, I wish that that was the case. I think that's probably not human nature to feel the same sense of urgency all the time. I think we can't function if we're on high alert all the time. That said, I, you know, I hope we put in place some things that may maybe make a difference. You know, um, I think about an initiative that we started um, with the uh, corporate coalition and our um, uh, our initiative, We Rise Together, really looking at, it, at how do you have a recovery that has equity at the lens. And we developed this initiative a year after the murder of George Floyd called 525 Moving to Action. And the point of that was um, back right at the time um, of George Floyd murder, there was, everybody put out statements there was this sense of urgency. There was this sense of outrage. And we felt that a year later, we should revisit this and really think about how do you go from the statements to actually action? And we got 25 corporations uh, to sign up to say, you know, we are willing to be accountable for actually moving things forward. And so that's the kind of thing that I think we have to keep doing because it's, you know, it's not because people don't care. It's that, you know, urgency just doesn't last forever. And we've got to hold companies accountable. We have to hold ourselves accountable to really thinking about, you know, let's not forget that moment. You know, that was an important moment. That was a moment that really brought people together, multi-generational, a real sense of, you know, as we call racial reckoning. How do we continue to make sure that we are all thinking about the part that we can play and integrating it? And that's why the 525 move to action. And there are, you know, there, there are other lots of other um, uh, private sector initiatives. But just using that as an example, you know, people looked at how do you build that into your business so that this is not just about charity, but how, how do you actually build this in such that this becomes the way we do business, that this becomes something that is routine, that is consistent with our overall business uh, imperatives. And I think that's the way you do it, is to do it not as some special off to the side, but something that is really core to, you know, what you're doing, Understanding that, um, which I hope that you know, is is a place where more and more companies have moved. That we will all do better when our workforces are more diverse. When we invest in the neighborhoods um, where we are situated, such that we are actually seen as a value to that neighborhood and not as extractive. You know, so all of these sorts of things, I think, really make a huge. <laughs> You know, I think they make a huge difference in terms of whether or not those things stick or whether they are just flash in the pan. What would you say is, is sort of the, the untapped potential in Chicago? What are the, the strengths that the community has that maybe we're not leveraging to the fullest? You know, one of the um, initiatives that we have in the stream that we call um, uh, building collective power is the change maker network and the change maker network is a network that really builds on existing community assets and resources but really helps to give them the tools to be a learning community and to share and i think if we can do more of that really looking at the assets that are in neighborhoods you know whether it's block clubs whether it's civic organizations whether it's faith institutions etc you know those are the strengths in communities and if we can continue to build on those and help organizations that exist who know their communities to really develop the tools to use their voices, be at the table, um, you know, really become actors in their own uh, future, you know, that's when I think we start to build that kind of civic strength that is really so critical. 
what were you know some of the more persistent challenges that still need to be addressed and what do you feel like you weren't able to get to in your time here? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a long. Where do I start? Yeah, where do I start? How much time do we have? There, there's, a, you know, there's a, a long list of things. You know, first and foremost, but but I will say, I think a lot of the things that we're doing, we just need to continue doing them. You know, I, I do think that um, <clears throat> it's not just um, the things that we. Sorry, the questions are coming fast and furious. She hasn't had time to take a sip. <laughs> we, uh, you know, not just we Chicago Community Trust, but we who are gathered here who in some way or the other have a piece of the puzzle and a piece of the solution, answers to, to, to some of the um, challenges. I think if we can keep staying the course, that's, to me, that's the biggest thing is that so often, you know, we flit from, you know, one project to the next project. Uh, you know, it was enterprise zones and it's opportunity zones and it's, you know, can we just stay the course for the things that we know <laughs> work? And, and that doesn't mean be rigid. That means, you know, test and learn. And, and, you know, as people say, fail fast, you know, figure out what's working and then let's kind of collectively put our resources into the things that we know work. And let's agree that we're going to do it for a decade or two decades. And, you know, and, and really, that, I think that consistency more than anything new. And yes, there, there are always going to be new things and new ways of doing things. But to me, I think it's more the consistency um, than anything else. And so... Uh, yes, what, if I had stayed, are there things that we would have done mid-course correction? Sure. But I think if we had said, all right, uh, close ratio up, yeah, done with that, now let's move on. Uh, <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, and I do, you know, I, I guess the other thing is getting better and better at listening to communities. And, you know, I think we learn that in the work that we're doing. Um, that the, you know, the wisdom really does lie in communities. And I think, you know, in what we're trying to do with a lot of the work that we're involved in is bringing community voices to the table with the private sector, with the public sector, with philanthropic partners. How do you do that better so that we really are looking at our work from the lens of what really matters the most to communities? Um, during your tenure, the trust's assets grew, uh, your grant making increased. What are you most proud of? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I, you know, I guess I'm most proud of the fact that we came up with um, a way of thinking about our work that I, I think will endure. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we have grown our resources. And not only have we grown our resources, uh, but I think we've gotten deeper in our relationship with our donors. And I think that matters because I think more and more of our donors want to go on a journey with us. And, I, you know, and it's um, getting more resources is important, but also getting more resources as we talk about collaborative philanthropy, people who will co-invest with us. And I think that's been huge to be able to have a lot of our donor base who at one point um, trusted us to invest their resources and increasingly trust us to uh, be direct co-investors in the things that we have said really make a difference uh, for the Chicago region. So I think some of those sort of things, I mentioned the policy and advocacy, I think it's huge to be able, you know, as a, as a public charity, we have greater latitude for doing policy and advocacy work. And I look at something like the coalition that we put together, and I think uh, I, I saw um, Woodstock here earlier. Um, 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 you know, we put together a coalition to look at the issue of predatory lending. And with partners, we're able to help get legislation passed that took um, the interest rate from almost 300% if you had to go out and get a payday loan to 30 uh, to a 36% cap. 
Now, 36% is probably still too high for people who have very, who are often unbanked, have limited resources, but it sure is lower than 300%. And so those are the kinds of things that I think, you know, um, I feel really good about. And, and the fact that we did it uh, in, in coalition, because I think, again, you know, being able to do it in partnership is so critical. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the staff that we have. Uh, you know, we. <laughs> you know, when you um, are the leader of an organization, oftentimes people give you more credit than you deserve, and usually it's the people who are behind you or who you work with on a day-to-day -day basis who are really the ones. And, you know, I feel like as a leader, the best thing I can do is hire bright people and get out of their way to do what they do. So, you know, I'm incredibly proud of the team that we have at the Trust. In you know, incredibly um, proud of the board that we have. Our executive committee or our board um, have really been true partners in our journey. And, uh, you know, uh, people who work for boards often have board hor horror stories of, uh, you know, contentious relationships, whatever. We have a board who has been behind us all the way, next to us all the way, uh, real true partners in that. So, you know, I, those are some of my uh, pride points. And, I, you know, again, and I've said it over and over and over again, the partnerships that we've developed. I, I'd just be interested how, you know, um, everybody in the room who's a, who's a donor to the trust raised their hand. How, how many people are grant recipients of the trust? How many people are philanthropic partners with the trust? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, that public sector partners with the trust. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> Uh, as I look around this room, you know, this is what is going to make all, you know, these things come about. And that's, to me, what I'm most proud of. I mean, when I uh, did this the first time, I was looking at a room full of strangers. Now I look and I see a room full of partners, collaborators and friends. And, you know, um, that's a pride point. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to pivot towards a, a couple of um, questions submitted from all of you, because one of the things that you mentioned, you talked about, you know, sort of uh, bringing in more advocacy and policy work from the trust. Um, and one of our questions is directly related to that. Um, in putting that work in place, what would you do differently? And what advice would you give to other foundations who've come to realize it, the need to advocate as well? Um, so, you know, I think everybody does it in their own way. And I think um, every, again, because we're a public charity, we have the ability to directly lobby to a certain extent, um, be engaged in advocacy directly. But others can fund policy organizations. And I just think that the importance of recognizing that it is not just our dollars, but it's how we're changing systems and how we're using our dollars in ways that can actually create long-term sustained change. So, you know, I think everybody has to do it in their own way, but I think it's an important part of the work that we do. Um, this question is about HBCUs. So <laughs> I'm biased, so I'm gonna ask it. Um, what are the strengths of Spelman, the faculty, the alumni? Um, what are the strengths of Spelman that you anticipate elevating um, and in bringing greater recognition of its specific contributions, uh, research, scholarship, innovation, civic leadership, and HBCUs in general? Well, I think um, HBUs, HBCUs have uh, perhaps finally seen their day. Um, you know, whether it's Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris, et cetera, you know, I think people have had now who didn't know about HBCUs had a huge, have a huge appreciation for the role that they play. And I think in a society where, um, we recognize 
the importance of diversity, the importance of having diverse voices at the table. I think HBCUs are going to continue to play an incredibly important role. And being able to change the, the lives and uh, trajectories of young African-American women who, you know, they come in, they, they all want to change the world. And being able to give them what they need to, to go out and, and do that is, you know, what really motivates me. I mean, Spelman last year, I think, had close to 14,000 applications for a class of 550. So the demand is there. Um, and I want to be able to, in whatever way I can, make it possible that if you're a young woman and you want to spell an education, finances are not what keeps you from doing it. And today that's the case. You know, like so many uh, educational uh, institutions now, if you're uh, Pell eligible and, and really come from low interest, uh, uh, low economic background, you might have an opportunity because there are there are grants available. If you come from a very wealthy family or family who can you know primarily pay, but there's also this group in the middle where there's no real uh, financial, uh, you know, there's there are no scholarships. They don't have parents who can pay. And the stories that I heard over and over again about young women who, brilliant, who started, who had to stop because they had too much debt um, and maybe returned or maybe didn't return. So, you know, I want to be able to help make sure that if you are a young woman who wants to change the world and you choose Spelman, that you're able to do that and that finances are not um, the obstacle and that we have the kind of faculty that really embrace um, changing the lives of, of young, bright girls. So that's shorthand for uh, I'm leaving a job where I give out money to go to a job <laughs> where I have to raise money. <laughs> but this is the second time I have <laughs> gone, as they say, from the other side of the to the other side of the check. Well, and you, you know, you've said that this is like one of the hardest or the hardest career decision that you've had to make. What made it so difficult? Because uh, I love what I'm doing. You know, I absolutely love what I'm doing. And I, you know, I, I love Chicago. Um, and I, you know, frankly, I was planning to do another two, three years and retire. And I had my life all planned. I was going to lay on the beach. <laughs> life plans. You know, <laughs> read trashy novels and eat bonbons. And, you know, uh, but, you know, when I was asked to consider this, I also had to ask myself, was I really going to lay on the beach and read trashy novels? <laughs> no, probably not. And so if, if I had energy left, um, and this is, I thought this was my last job. This one really will be, <laughs> you know, I mean, it if, I mean it this time. Um, and if I had something else that I could do in life, it is giving back to the next generation. And so for me, uh, and I've, I've said oftentimes, even in my own job, uh, even in my current job, you know, the thing that gives me the most encouragement is when I talk to young people and I realize that they're seeing the world in different ways and that they want different things and that they believe in a world of uh, where equity is, you know, a given and where we think about how we treat our planet and, uh, you know, how we think about living life with purpose. And so, you know, if I can be a part of helping to shape that next generation, then I think that's something worth extending my <laughs> work life for, for a little <laughs> bit longer. And, uh, but yeah, it is, it, you know, this has been such an incredibly fulfilling job. So it was incredibly hard to make the decision. Uh, we're almost out of time. I've got one more question. So I apologize uh, to those of you whose questions I did not get to. Thank you for submitting them. Um, but what will you miss most from Chicago? Mm, this is a tough one. Uh, well, not really. Uh, for, for me, what I'll miss most of the people, I really will. I mean, I, you know, I have fallen in love with uh, Chicago. Chicago has welcomed me. Um, there is something special about 
the spirit of people here. And so, you know, that's what I miss. I mean, I'll miss Lake Michigan. I, you know, I'm trading my lovely view of Lake Michigan for a view of 2,000 hormonal young girls <laughs> <laughs> next to a campus of 2,000 hormonal young boys. You know, it's like... <laughs> You know, I go from being a childless woman to now being the mother of two thousand. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is, that is like, you can come what, back anytime what you like. What was wrong with my decision making? But anyway, um, you know, I will, I, you know, I'll miss the restaurants. I'll miss the, I'll miss the uh, festivals in the park and all the rest of it. But really, I just will miss the spirit of Chicago. I think that's a good place to leave it. Please help me thank Dr. Helene Gale.